Hi, I'm Kimberly Bennett, licensed professional counselor of over 20 years and a homeschooling mom for five of those years. I am also a blogger, a digital content creator, and a podcaster. I also run two free advocacy and resource websites. It's onlyhomeschooling.com and the homeschoolcounselingnetwork.com. The Homeschool Counseling Network was founded to bridge the gap between homeschooling families and professionals in the areas of coaching, education, mental health, therapy, and all sorts of professionals out there that are here to support you in your homeschooling journey. In a previous video, I talked with you about handling big feelings. Specifically, we talked about emotional regulation, what it is and what it is not. We also talked about the function of feelings, how there are four. If you would like to learn more about that video, check out the Homeschool Quest workshops over at their YouTube channel or visit the Homeschool Counseling Network dot kinds and hopefully you are feeling like you can give yourself permission to feel more freely now that you know that feelings have a purpose they're there they serve their function they keep us safe they promote bonding they help with communication and well really they do have a purpose even the yucky ones that we don't today like. we are going to talk about the feeling thought behavior connection and I'm, I'm going to start out with a quote from one of my favorite, um, I'm going to say giants in psychology, if you will. He was actually a psychiatrist and his name was Dr. Victor Frankl. Dr. Victor Frankl, this is his book, one of his many, many books. He wrote over 30, actually. This is one of his books, Man's Search for Meaning. Victor Frankl um, survived the Holocaust and he wrote about his experience of surviving um, concentration camps during, Nazi, uh, during the Nazi time in Germany. And I'm telling you, that's it, it, there's nothing that will illustrate for you the power of the human spirit and the power of our ability to survive things we think we cannot survive more so than this book. So it, it looks kind of small, that is deceptive, but what is inside it, take your time with it and guard your heart if you choose to read this, because it does talk about the triumph of the human spirit and how the key to freedom is actually, is actually inside our minds. So it's a very, very powerful, powerful book if you decide to read that, Victor Frankl's um, Man's Search for Meaning. But here is one of my favorite quotes for him from Dr. Frankel. Between stimulus and response, there is a space. In that space is our power to choose our response. And our response allows our growth and our freedom. Victor Frankel. Very, very powerful quote. And we'll dissect that a little bit more as we go through the video. Reaction is where it happens without thinking. It's instinctual. We talked earlier in our first video about the importance of the limbic system and the amygdala area of the brain and how if we're ever in a room with a saber-toothed tiger, we can be very grateful that our amygdala does its response and has us engage in that fight or flight response. It does its job. The problem is when we react that way, <laughs> when there's no, to, to a math test versus a saber-toothed tiger. So we can be grateful that our amygdala is there, but sometimes we have to learn how to retrain our amygdala. In order to do that, we're gonna learn today about the situation, thoughts, feeling, behavior, connection. Reaction, so I'm gonna put up here um, a little bit of uh, an infographic that can kind of help explain this a little bit better. I do well with visuals. That's the kind of learner that I am. So I'm gonna provide the visuals for you today as we talk about it. So feelings can feel automatic like we don't have any control over them, like they happen that fast, or at least they appear to. In reality, there really is a tiny space, this is what Dr. Frankel was talking about, in the moments between experiencing a feeling, processing this feeling, attaching this feeling to a thought, and then acting on that feeling. But it is in that small, small space where we hold all the power. I want to clarify the use of the term triggered because it actually is a term we use in psychology. It's become very common and used a bit more casually, almost tongue in cheek 
these days, but it actually is a term that we use in mental health. And it refers to um, a situation or an event. It could actually be a sensory experience. Any of our senses, um, touch, taste, sight, smell. Smell particularly is one of the strongest scents linked to memory just because of where the olfactory sense is located and in location to the brain, if you will, actually is one of our strongest links to memory. But it actually is a term that we use that says, okay, when we have this experience, somewhere it's reminding us of a previous experience we have had before. Um, usually in terms of a negative connotation, like since scent is the strongest link, scent, the strongest sense that we have this link to memory, you can smell freshly baked chocolate chip cookies, and that can just remind you of a positive experience at home. But we wouldn't necessarily, or in your grandmother's kitchen or in your mom's kitchen, for me, whenever I smell Chanel number no. five, I immediately think of my mom in church on Sundays because that's what she wore when I was a child. But when we talk about the term triggered, what we mean is usually a negative experience. Okay, so what is the situation, thoughts, feelings, behavior, connection? Well, a situation also known as the stimulus that um, Dr. Frankel was referring to, it's anything that happens to a person. Then that is connected to um, our thoughts, which is how we interpret that situation, what we think about it. Um, is this a positive thing that's happening? Is this a bad thing about it that's happening? Is this scary? Is this safe? Is this neutral? Then once we have our thoughts around it, we attach a feeling. Those our feelings are then generated by that thought. If it's a safe situation, we might feel neutral. If it's an exciting situation, we might feel happy. If it's a scary situation interpreted as such, then we might feel fearful. That in turn impacts our behavior, our emotions, and our actions that we have in response to those feelings. And notice here at the bottom, I said in response. There is a difference between reaction and response. Reaction happens automatically and instinctually, and response happens where we slow down and have the power to choose. So, we have, as Dr. Frankel was saying, these little bitty pockets of time. And in those little bitty pockets of time, they're so minute and so quick that they appear to happen almost automatically. In fact, even back up here in the thoughts portion, they're known as automatic thoughts. In therapy, when we have a client and we talk about the situations that bring them to therapy, usually there's one big thing that we focus on when clients come to therapy. It's known as the presenting problem. Sure, there's probably more than one thing that you can work on, but if you try to work on too many things at one time, you end up with a very frustrated client and a very frustrated therapist. And it's stressful. You really just need to pick one focus of your session at a time that you're going to work on for that time. And then you also make achievable goals for that. So the situation or presenting problem, that's what brings them into therapy. Then as we talk about the presenting problem, we start to identify thoughts that are attached to that problem. We call them, and a lot of times we're not even aware, the client's not even aware of these automatic thoughts that we have it they've just been kind of ruminating underneath the surface and around in our subconscious if you will um, different things that we may think about an event such as i'll give you an example um, i'm not a big fan of math it would not surprise me to learn that probably have undiagnosed dyscalculia. I've made it this far into adulthood. Guess what? I chose a major that didn't involve math. I know statistics decently. I hired a statistician to help me understand my own thesis in grad school, but hey, I made it and then didn't have to go to school anymore. And I was like, woohoo. And then I ended up being a homeschool parent, but I digress. So long story short, when it's time to teach math with my child, that's my situation. That's my presenting problem. My immediate thought is, oh no, this was awful the first time around and I didn't like it the first time around. That's still my automatic thought, right? Oh, math. I don't, we don't like math. What's my feeling attached to that? Oh, this is terrible. I didn't do that well in math growing up. How can I possibly teach my, my child? That's my feelings, correct? I've got fear. I've got worry. I've got thoughts of you're not qualified to teach your child math. Sure I am. Thank you, YouTube. 
um, then my behavior is okay. This is where we have all the control in the world, right over here with behavior. I can choose how I want to respond to that. This is where I have the most control, where I stop. That big moments of opportunity that Dr. Frankel was talking about, where I go and take a few deep breaths and allow the feeling to pass. Feelings are like the I'm going to say like the weather, but it's more like the weather on a, more like clouds on a cloudy day. That's probably a better example because clouds on a windy day, they're going to pass by pretty quickly. And if you wait long enough, it'll pass. Give yourself just a minute. We're going to talk about in upcoming workshops of a one very powerful technique that I use at home and that I've used in my private practice, but I wanted to lay the groundwork here with this foundation on the thoughts, feeling, behavior, situation, connection before I got to that, but it's called the power of the pause. So make sure you stay tuned for future workshops on the power of the pause. But as I'm doing this before, when the feeling happens, when that automatic thought hits, oh no, I've got to teach math. Do I know what I'm doing? Am I qualified? All of the terrible negative thoughts that are automatic that I've learned, I've had to learn to identify over the years and move out of the way. Just like I'm waiting for that cloud to pass. I'm going to let that thought pass. I'm going to let that feeling pass. And I'm going to go. And I'm going to breathe. Really, really breathe. When you can't control anything else in this world, you can control how you breathe and give myself that moment to let that emotion pass so that I can feel a bit more in control of the moment by controlling the one thing that I can control, the heart rate and the respiratory rate. That's how powerful breathing is, just by breathing. You breathe into the count of five, hold for a count of five, and exhale out your mouth to the count of five. You notice how you can hear a little bit, that little bit of hiss on the end of that breath. So in through your nose, deep, deep down in the bottom of your lungs. Hold. And exhale. If you do that for at least five times, that's my five rule. You'll be amazed at how calm you feel how much more in control of your emotions and of your thoughts that you feel. Practice this with yourself. Practice this with your child. I'm Kimberly Bennett. Thank you so much for watching today. To learn more about how you can help your child manage big feelings, make sure to stay tuned to the Homeschool Quest, where I will be talking on the power of the pause in my next workshop. And for your resource where you can find supportive professionals and all types of content from blog posts to blog posts to free printables and downloads to help support you in the areas of education and tutoring, counseling, mental health, coaching, therapy, courses, classes. We have all types of resources to support you. Visit my website at homeschoolcounselingnetwork.com. I'll see you soon.